High performance and energy efficiency are terms that are often thrown around interchangeably in the building industry, mostly for marketing purposes. However, energy efficiency and high performance are not the same thing at all. Energy efficiency is something that we can actually measure. Does the assembly, component, or appliance reduce the amount of energy needed to heat or cool the building based on the occupant's living patterns? And does the building stay warmer or cooler for a longer period of time? That's something that we can calculate, model, and measure after it's been in service. High performance, on the other hand, is a much more nebulous term. Many people would agree that energy efficiency is a component of high performance, but it's not the defining factor. Some people have even defined high performance as a smart home with technologically sophisticated appliances. A high performance home or building is an approach to building envelope or enclosure design that takes the aspects of energy efficiency, but adds factors like long-term durability, redundancy, occupant comfort and health, and full environmental control of the interior space, providing a high level of predictability in how the interior space operates and how the overall enclosure performs as a holistic system. Throwing more insulation into a wall or insulating with a specific product does not automatically make something high performance. Just how construction methods like SIPs or precast concrete are not by default high performance. They can be integrated into a high-performance enclosure design, but it's about the thoughtful implementation of these systems with the rest of the building. We want to take a systems-based approach, which means that we need to be thinking about things like how the walls transition to the roof assembly, the type of roof assembly that we're working with, if we're venting the roof, we need to create service cavities below the air barrier and not within the unconditioned space, and the service cavities should be integrated into the architecture and the design, it shouldn't be an afterthought during construction, do we have some sort of heat recovery system so we're making the most out of the BTUs that we're using? That comes back to energy efficiency, but it's also quite practical. How are we getting fresh air into the building if the air outside is of a poor quality? How are we managing water from the roof to the walls down to the foundation? How are we controlling interior relative humidity? What's the maintenance schedule like? Now, here's the hard truth. These are all things that we need to be thinking about, whether we're looking to build a high-performance home or just a well-built home that won't cause any problems in the future. Some climates are a lot more forgiving than others, and you can get away with a lot riskier assemblies in climates that are dry and warm. A lot of people don't realize this, but that perceived gap between high performance and just a well-built home is narrowing, especially as we build with more moisture-sensitive materials and as codes increase the required amount of insulation and as we place buildings under a higher risk of water intrusion. With that being said, I think there are some strategies that we can all implement to achieve a high-performance, comfortable, and durable building that's a step up from what we would consider a standard well-built home. Let's talk about the first one, which is ditching the house wrap and opting for either a self-adhering or fluid-applied water-resistive barrier system. This is going to provide a monolithic water and air control layer that's bonded to the sheathing rather than flapping in the wind like a house wrap or building wrap and won't allow water or air to travel freely behind the sheathing and behind the WRB really good at resisting bulk water intrusion and exterior air infiltration. It's very easy to flash to with pressure sensitive acrylic tapes and liquid applied flashings, and it is one of the best investments that you can make in your building enclosure. Before we get people in the comments screaming that buildings need to breathe, whatever that means, there are many vapor permeable self-adhering products and fluid applied products on the market. We shouldn't even be having this discussion in 2025, so ditch the building wrap and go with something that's actually adhered or bonded to your sheathing. While we're on the same topic of water, we also want to see a ventilated rain screen on the outside of the building. This is a drainage gap and ventilation space between the cladding and the water resistive barrier. This pressure balances the system and alleviates hydrostatic pressure that could result in water leaking in through penetrations and imperfections in the WRB if it's held in tension. The drainage portion of the rain screen is the most important since we can use gravity to get rid of that water very quickly, but we want the benefits of airflow within that gap to help speed up the drying process, and so we want anywhere between a half inch and a one inch gap between the cladding and the WRB. Anything more than that and we risk fire being able to travel freely within that space if you're building in a wildfire zone. Along that same vein, we want to design a very simple roof form. 
This makes drainage patterns a lot more predictable. It makes the insulation strategy a lot more predictable. Easier implementation of the air barrier, which is absolutely critical to preventing condensation problems in roofs. If we need to vent the roof, a simple roof form eliminates the complexity of dealing with intersecting roof geometry like dormers and gables. You eliminate the amount of transition details where the roofers might miss a flashing or improperly flash an intersecting sidewall. The simpler you can make your roof form, the higher chance of success in terms of water management, maintenance, energy efficiency, cost, and long-term durability. We can also design our structure so that we're providing easy paths for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing services without compromising the architecture or the enclosure. Use things like open web trusses instead of standard dimensional lumber or eye joists. There's a lot more flexibility with trusses since the ductwork and the conduit can be maneuvered within the cavity space without having to cut holes into the joists or create dropped ceilings or soffits. They cost a little bit more, but they provide a level of flexibility in the design as well as predictability and can eliminate a lot of the headaches when it comes to implementing HVAC services later on. We also want a fresh air system to service the building. Remember, we want full environmental control of the building, and that means controlling the air that enters and exits the building, filtering it, tempering it, dehumidifying it, and distributing the air where we want it, and exhausting the air at controlled rates so we're not overventilating or underventilating. A fresh air system is not only necessary for a good building, but it's critical for occupant health, and it's a major part of the interior moisture control strategy. When we say fresh air systems, we're referring Referring to ERVs and HRVs, or energy recovery ventilators and heat recovery ventilators, you can also get the added benefit of being able to recycle some of that heat loss. You can also use systems like ventilating dehumidifiers if you're in hot, humid climates. We can't control the air outside, but we can and should control the air inside. So I hope this video shed some light on the differences between energy efficiency and quote-unquote high performance. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.